We've talked about things that I definitely love, so now let's talk about things that I definitely love that you guys definitely hate. Otherwise known as they're my favourites, leave them alone. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I am here today to steal a video. Well not so much a whole video, just, just a video concept, I'm borrowing it. A few months ago the lovely Jean from Jean's Bookish Thoughts did a video wherein she went through her Goodreads shelves and she looked at the lowest rated books there and she reviewed them. So I thought hey that sounds like a salt mountain that we can dig into together. So I dug out trusty Arthur Shelby to come and help give me some opinions and uh, I sorted through my Goodreads shelf in order of average rating starting at the lowest and I discovered a couple of things. First thing is you all are wrong and the second thing is that when you sort by lowest average rating on Goodreads what appears to happen is that in amongst the actual novels that I'm going to review there are some photography collections, some poetry collections, some short stories, some audible shorts. I'm not going to bother with those. So let's dig into this vat of opinion shall we? So the first book, the lowest rated book on my Goodreads shelves is See What I Have Done by Sarah Schmidt and this comes in at a 3.2 stars and I have given it two stars but I gave this one two stars retrospectively. This book and other books like it is one of the reasons why on my channel I've stopped giving things star ratings because it's so incredibly subjective. How I feel about books now and what star rating I would give them now is not necessarily the star rating I gave them in 2017. Not just because your tastes change but also because the further away from a book that you get I think the more perspective that you get and whether it stays with you slash whether it sours in your mind like this one did really makes a big difference to what star rating you give it. This novel is like a retelling slash reimagining of the Lizzie Borden mystery. So in 1890s something or other Lizzie Borden's stepmother and her father were found killed with an axe and she was the only suspect but we've never really found out the truth and of course that's where the rhyme comes about Lizzie and her axe. It's all very fascinating. I genuinely am really interested in the case and the way that it's sort of took hold of the media at the time. However, this book is a weird sort of collection of almost vignettes. You follow Lizzie and her family through one day and through then several flashbacks. And one of my issues with it was that we didn't actually get to the catalyst of the reason that Lizzie seemingly killed her parents until two thirds of the way through when we were introduced to a character that we had never met before who was very obviously handed to us as sort of a questionable moustache twirling villain who had had influence over the family and it just didn't feel right. I honestly couldn't tell you why I rated this so highly at the time that I read it because the other thing that exists in my mind about this book, the only other thing, is the copious amounts of vomit on every other page. This is not a book to read if you are triggered by that and I'm not going to give you any descriptions or anything here but there is so much of it just all the way through it's unnecessary. Nobody needed to know. So yes I agree with the rating about this one and I'm not entirely sure what Leanne of 2017 thought she was doing. You were wrong Leanne of 2017 so just sit there in your wrongness and be wrong. And if anybody got that quote I need to know about it down in the comments below we need to have a chat because if you got that quote you're one of my people. Oh next up we have got Foxlow by Eleanor Wasserberg which comes in at 3.31 on Goodreads. I love this book. What book are you people reading? As you can see I gave this one five stars. I absolutely love it. But I think I know exactly the reason that some of you don't like this novel. Foxlow is at its heart about a commune and it actually popped up at a really weird time with a lot of other novels that were also about communes and communal living and sort of the you know Manson family vein of things. We follow Green who is a girl who is looking back on her life growing up at Foxlow. She was a very little girl when she went there with her sister and she's now out in the world and the real world with the rest of us where rules exist and laws exist and we don't perform moon ceremonies and she has to kind of come to terms with the fact that she 
ran away, she got out. She didn't leave, she got out. So the chapters sort of go back and forth between her experience there and trying to assimilate into a normal life. And I think that might be one of the reasons why you guys don't like this novel. Because although there is definitely a mounting dread and a mounting creepiness throughout this novel, where you're aware that as Green is telling you things from a very innocent point of view, they're not really that innocent, you are also kind of having to live that every day with her and it can get a little bit plodding. It does take a little bit of time to get where you're going and I guess that for some people where it eventually ends up would not be enough of a payoff for all of the build up but it's the kind of thing that I really love. In fact when we next talk about the things that I love in books we may or may not be talking about this book in the context of a category which is books where not very much happens. Next up for the lowest rated novels we have The Upstairs Room by Kate Murray Brown and I'm outraged. I'm just going to outright say you're wrong. You're wrong. Your 3.36 rating is wrong, Goodreads. I'm genuinely shook. Oh, and here I thought that the salt was just going to be like surface salt, but we're really getting into it now. This is a book about a young family who finally get their dream house. They buy a mid-terrace house in London that's definitely a fixer-upper. There's mouldy wallpaper, there's old furniture, and upstairs in the attic there's a very creepy room with child handwriting on the walls where the children used to stay with some not okay things written on the walls. But as they start their renovations, as they start sort of getting comfortable in the house, the house starts to very clearly tell them that they are not welcome. The thing is, the house only does this when the husband is not at home, which makes it look very quickly like his wife is slowly losing it. And if I'm very honest, if I just climb back out of the bunker that I have made for myself, made of this book, I will be honest and I think that's one of the reasons why this might be a bit of a Marmite haunted house story for some people. Because that's what it fundamentally is. It's, it's a horror novel, it stays on my horror shelves, but it does have one foot in literary fiction because at the heart of the novel there is just a huge question mark. We are never really sure as readers if the husband is right and it's this really icky like question mark that you carry on with throughout the novel where you're like is it or is it not but is it or is it not and then the thing with the kitchen drawers happen and then you're like <gasps> there is one character in this novel that I will say was to my mind almost completely superfluous to the plot I understood what Kate Murray Brown wanted her for but I hated I hated that extra character so maybe that's an influence maybe some of you guys also don't like the lodger I'm just wholesale willing to say that you're all wrong this is a magnificent book and I will I will go back for it again and again and again and I will not stop recommending it because it's wonderful really creepy like need a shower creepy which is my kind of creepy right let's see if you can redeem yourselves guys okay so next up we have got The Vanishing by Tim Crabbe which has a rating of 3.36 on Goodreads and I gave it three stars. And I think I would still stand by that rating now. I read this in 2016, so it was a while ago, but curiously, it's one of those books that's kind of stuck in my mind. I forget the main characters' names, but this is about a young couple who are on a road trip in France and they get to the point where they need petrol, they pull into a petrol station and they separate. One of them goes in to pay and one of them stays by the car and the girl in the couple is abducted. She vanishes without a trace and it's so without a trace that it actually takes a little while for her partner to raise the alarm and so by the time that they've done that and they've looked back at security footage and things the person who abducted her is long long gone. This book sort of sets itself up to be a snapshot into the mind of somebody who would commit this horrible crime and then a look at what would happen to the victims as a result of it and it's really not, it's mostly about the boyfriend's obsession which is fine but at the same time he's one of those characters that I never really felt 
became fully formed. The only thing I knew about him was that he was obsessed with finding his girlfriend again. I didn't know anything about him or really their relationship pre this. So that was a bit complicated. But what I really, really enjoyed was that the person who abducts her is a very average person who lives a very average life. And we see the way that his plans, his very not average, very weird, very horrible plans, fit in alongside his normal everyday life and that he thinks about like buying apples and then the next minute he's also like oh but I'll also need rope for the garrote and so you're like there's this horrible sense that this could be your next door neighbour and in fact with my next door neighbours it probably is. I agree with the rating on this one. I'm not sad that I read it. It was a good experience but I definitely wouldn't read it again and I probably wouldn't recommend it. Okay so next we've got an audible short and like a sort of short self-help book. Oh, then we have Faux, which I actually remember nothing about. Like, I remember nothing about this novel because I read it for university and I hated it. And I, after I read it, I chose not to use it as one of the texts that I used in my essay. So we're just going to skip right on by that one. It's a retelling of Robinson Crusoe and the only reason that Robinson Crusoe exists in the canon is because men put it there. It's bad. So there's my review of that. Ah! Next up we have I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. This has got a 3.5 rating on Goodreads and I gave it two stars and I still freaking agree with my two stars. This was one of those novels that I picked up because a handful of the people that I really really trust on booktube were raving about it and you guys were wrong. Wrong. I was lulled into a false sense of security. This is a novel about a couple who are on a road trip and the girlfriend while they're on this road trip is thinking about ending things. She's thinking that this is probably going to be the last road trip that they take together and she's not very happy in this relationship and then a storm hits and they have to pull off the road into a secluded farm. That's what the blurb says, that's not what's actually happening. The couple are going on a trip to his parents farm which is not at all like a creepy weird secluded farm and she is thinking about ending things but that's where all of the logic and sense in this novel ends. Editing Leanne from the future here welcome we are kneeling on the floor surrounded by books I'd, so professional. For some reason the rant portion of this video was gone for this particular book and I just can't have that because I hated this book so much that you have to know. This book took some massive massive swings that it just completely missed. It tried to do stream of consciousness but it really ended up being more like lurching from one disconnected thought to another. It also tried to do the thing with an unreliable narrator where about halfway through you're suddenly not sure which person is speaking, but for me, instead of adding to the plot, that just made me really frustrated. One of the things that I hate, I just cannot stand in horror novels, is when the entire plot hinges on the character having a mental health problem. And that was really what this character had. Quick spoiler here, when I stop talking about it, this word will go away, so you can mute me until it does, or fast forward. There is a twist in this novel where the character essentially has multiple personality disorder and it's so badly handled and so offensively done and there's definitely some very heavy-handed very strong hints that it's not just multiple personality disorder that it is also that the character is transsexual and hates themselves for it and I hate it it's not okay it's just not okay yeah, I feel passionate enough about this that I literally took a break in my day to kneel on my floor and tell you about this. So yeah, what past Leanne is about to say. Also, I'm never getting those four hours back, you know what I mean? Okay, on to book number six. So there's a shorter story and then there is Fierce Kingdom by Jen Phillips. So this one has a rating of 3.54 stars on Goodreads and I have said in my comments for it, actually a very affectionate 3.75 stars, loved it a lot and I've given it four. I still agree with that. Fierce Kingdom is a shorter thriller. It's not a novella but it's under the 300 page mark and it is about a woman who has taken her little boy 
to the zoo. They go to the zoo very often, they have a season pass for it and it's one of the only things that she finds like calms him down and gives them both a little bit of headspace. It's a very relaxing thing for them. And then as the zoo is about to close, she takes him by the hand, she starts walking to the exit and she sees bodies on the ground and then she hears shooting and they have to hide. The reason that I say that this was quite an affectionate 3.7 stars is because Although the writing wasn't the most amazing thing in the world, it wasn't like blowing my mind, it was perfectly serviceable to give me a real page turner of a plot. I raced through this and read it really, really quickly. However, the criticisms that I've heard levelled at this novel include there's not really enough of the zoo setting used in the plot and I agree with that. There is one part in the novel wherein they do have to hide in an enclosure but none of the animals that are in the enclosure are really utilised in the plot and there's no sort of danger from the environment that she's in which you would expect in a zoo that there would be. There wasn't a, a real danger or a real threat from that so I think people were annoyed about that. And the other thing was that about halfway through the novel she finds a place to hide and there are some other people in this place where she goes to hide and there is a sort of like philosophical part of this novel where she starts thinking about what it would mean to sacrifice. It does slow the plot down, it does make it feel a little bit like well, I was in this racy plot and now I'm here and is anything actually going to happen? But I don't know, something about this still makes me smile when I think about it and it still makes me think of like the fun rides that I had when I was reading it. So I think I would still recommend this to people if with all of those caveats it still sounds interesting. I do need to discover whether Jim Phillips has written anything else because I would be interested in picking up other things that they have written. Okay so next up is The Strange Library by Haruka Murakami. Again I would consider this to be one of those weird short story anomalies and I hated it so we'll just leave that. An Almost Perfect Christmas is similar, it's kind of a short story. The Grown Up is kind of a short story and truly ma what is wrong with you people? <laughs> the next one that we've got is Truly Madly Guilty by Leanne Moriarty which has a 3.75 and I gave a 5 star. It's Why is Leanne Moriarty so far down on this list? Okay so I was a tiny bit duplicitous in my rage there because I both understand what people get annoyed about in this novel and why it's like the lowest rated Leanne Moriarty that I've got on my Goodreads clearly. Could you eat any more noisily? She's like, yes, yes I could. Truly Madly Guilty is about three families. Two of them have women in them who were best friends. They grew up together and they are kind of best friends now only because it's the done thing to do. You stay best friends with somebody that you grow up with when you don't have many other friends, right? And throughout this book, we are building up to a point where something horrible happened. We know from the very beginning of the book that something terrible happened. But we're also really like all other Leanne Moriarty books, we're discovering the characters and we're discovering what makes them tick. And I think the thing that really annoys people about this novel is that it takes a really, really long time to get to the event that happens and that if you're not completely invested in the characters and you're not there for like a character study of the characters, you're just going to feel shortchanged because the thing that happens while horrible is also not a thing with a thriller twist. There's not like a big gory creepy twist at the end of it and I think that's what I actually loved the most about this was that it was kind of a mystery thriller and that we were kind of building to a thing that we didn't really know about but that the thing that happened is actually something which could happen in any one of our backyards and so therefore it was like a very accessible incident to me to be like oh my god that's awful. What's important for me is not the incident itself it's the way that it has an impact on the characters and I know that this all sounds a little bit vague but I really really cannot tell you anything else about about what happens because it's almost the entire plot of the book. I get why people don't like it but I am still dearly devoted to it. I stand by those five stars. Okay so next up we've got Everything is Teeth which is a graphic novel so I'm just going to discount that and uh, 
I knew this one was going to be further down on the list. So this is All the Birds Singing by Evie Wilde. It's a 3.61 rating and I gave it 5 stars. And I stand by those 5 stars because it's one of my favourite books in the entire world. This novel is about a woman called Jake who is a sheep farmer in Scotland. And she lives on a very, very remote island with her dog. And she does not talk to anybody. She is the definition of a recluse but what we think at the novel which is that she's chosen that and she's perfectly happy with that slowly gets unpicked because in each alternate chapter we discover that actually this is a life that she's chosen because she has literally run away from everything everything that she ever had and that she is not a happy person and we work in a very weird way in this novel. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's near the bottom of this list because this novel does a dual timeline but we start in the present and we work to the past and then when we flip in the second chapter we work from the event in the past that caused her to run to Scotland in the first place and then backwards to her childhood. So you're not building to the big crescendo point and that's one of the reasons that I find it so fascinating. It is such a clever, clever play on time and it completely subverts everything that you expect that you're going to get. You think you know all of the really horrible worst things that have happened and then as you move back to our childhood you're like <laughs> actually everything that you assumed that you knew is also kind of not true and it just keeps peeling layers off and it's so satisfying and the end of this novel ends with a massive question mark. It really just takes the whole mess, dumps it in your lap, hands it to you and says so what do you think? And I know that that is some people's most hated thing. But this novel is breathtaking and it just... Mm. So I don't care what any of you all say, it's one of my favourite novels and you can't take it away from me and I'm definitely going to read it again soon because I've talked about it in like three videos since the start of this year so it's gonna have to happen. Okay what's next? So and then text from Jane Eyre is a funny collection of spoof texts about classics and if you like the idea of that you should absolutely read it because it's so funny it made me laugh so bad. Oh. And then we have got The Taking of Annie Thorne by CJ Tudor which has 3.63 and I gave it a 3 star which right now I think I am going to downgrade to a 2 star because mm, it's not good guys, it's not good. CJ Tudor is also an author that I think that I have broken up with, much like Shari Lapina, what I get from the synopsis and the promise is almost never what I get from the plot. Taking of Annie Thorne was most definitely just a straight up horror. There, there was no thriller elements to it whatsoever. And the other thing that was really annoying about it was it was almost identical, like almost completely identical at the start to the plot of The Chalk Man. In The Chalk Man we have a straight white cisgendered middle aged man who's trying to uncover a mystery from his childhood which ends with a very creepy twist at the end and in The Taking of Annie Thorne we have a straight white cisgendered middle aged man who has returned to his small town expressly to undo a mystery that happened in his childhood and then were handed a really ham-fisted horror. Just so many nonsensical scenes that are strung together in this plot and I never bought any of the reasons why he did things. So this one can just go in the bin where it belongs. It deserves to have been much further down that list. It definitely deserves to have been under Foxlow. Okay, let's see what's at number 10 after that rant. Mm. Number 10 is The Driver's Seat by Muriel Spark, which has a 3.63 rating. And I literally have said, well, that's one for the unhaul pile. And I've given it one star. I still don't know what to say about this novel. Ah, uh, so this is a short novel. It's really a novella. It could have been even shorter by cutting out the dross in the middle. And it is about a woman 
who hates her everyday life. In fact, the very start of this one is very weirdly reminiscent of The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, where we've got a character who just absolutely detests everything in their main life and they just want to get away from it. And I guess in The Haunting of Hill House, they drove to do an experiment in the middle of nowhere in a creepy house, whereas this one, she just gets on a plane and goes on holiday. And then the plot goes off a cliff. As if it wasn't already at the like tedious, really boring point, we are reminded of a man that she met on the plane. And the man that she met on the plane seemed a little bit dodgy at the time, and now, later on, she meets him again. I can't tell you what happens in the end of it, because it would spoil what little plot that there is. But needless to say, I believed in nothing in this novel. It was like Muriel Spark decided that she was going to get to this point with this character. She was going to get to the point where the horrible thing happened. And she was going to get there by just writing her way there. She was just going to say, I have a character, she goes on holiday, now what happens? And she just kind of sat there and went, hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's go buy a dress. And I actually read this one aloud to Lovely Wife Helen because it's so short that I thought, hmm, you know, maybe this would be a, a nice difference from what we usually read together, which is usually fantasy, middle grade, or mystery. And I was like, maybe it'll be just like a little short palate cleanser, and it was not. Both of us sat there at the end and looked at each other and went, I just, I don't get it. I just don't, I don't get it. This one was not written for me. So there we go. That was the 10 lowest rated novels on my Goodreads shelf. That was a truly mixed bag. Some of them I definitely agree with and I very much stand by. Others I am just, I just, I don't trust you anymore. I don't trust you anymore, guys. But really I think what this process has served to do for me is just prove how incredibly subjective ratings are. Those five stars mean so many different things to so many different people and it's why I don't use them anymore on my channel. So did you agree with me? Did you also love the books on this list or did you think that they were questionable and that my tastes are questionable and are you now doubting me? Are you now doubting my reviews or on the other hand did I trash some of your favourites? Come and tell me in the comments below. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing for more of my face and my opinions. And I will see you guys next time. Bye. Also, can I just say that this thing here, this thing, I bought this mostly so that I could put unhauled books on the top before I haul them. And it's now full and overflowing and there's some on my desk and there's some on that shelf over there and I am questioning all of my life choices. <laughs>